This month in practice up, micronutrients, vitamin minerals, incredibly important for basic cellular biochemical health and optimal function. However, a lot of practitioners are running micronutrient tests to see if somebody's low in it. My question is, is are they accurate or not? Well, in this month's Practice Up, I'm going to take one of the most popular micronutrients in this industry today and show you all the different ways of measuring it and just how inaccurate it actually is based on the scientific literature. And when you look at that, you're going to question how accurate the rest of them are as well. All that and so much more in this jam-packed edition of Practice Up. All right, welcome. I'm super excited about this month's content, so let's just go ahead and jump in. We're going to talk about the accuracy of micronutrient testing. Why? Because everybody, a lot of practitioners today are running micronutrient tests. They're running it in a variety of different tissues or fluids. It might be blood, it might be red blood cells, it might be white blood cells like lymphocytes, it might be in urine. My question to you is, is any of these tests even remotely accurate? Why do we need micronutrients in the first place? Look at biochemistry. Almost every single biochemical pathway requires at least one or some kind of micronutrient as a cofactor or coenzyme. You can't run your cells without micronutrients. Some people talk about carbs, proteins, and fats being an important, and they are. But you understand, you can't utilize carbs, proteins, and fats without micronutrients. There is nothing else that's more important than micronutrients. Not curcumin, not resveratrol, not green tea extract. People talk about glutathione all day long. You can't even make or utilize glutathione if you lack micronutrients. They are fundamentally important, and so it'd be great if we could test for what patients and clients needed when it comes to this. But my question is, is how accurate is that? Let's take a look. We're going to use one micronutrient, magnesium. Why? Because it's really popular, it's really well studied, and if this is inaccurate in testing, there's a good chance that most other micronutrients, vitamins, and minerals are inaccurate as well. Here's my basic thesis. You can run serum magnesium, that's fine. It's inexpensive. If it's low, somebody's probably low in magnesium, especially if you use an optimal reference range like I talk about elsewhere. But if serum magnesium is normal, and I add here at the bottom, or any other laboratory test for magnesium is normal, does not mean that that patient is magnesium replete, which means that, in other words, their laboratory test for magnesium might be normal, but they may be deficient at a cellular level. All right, so there's a bunch of different ways of measuring magnesium, serum, red blood cell, urine, feces, hair. There's ionized, which is free. There's an ionized and total magnesium ratio. There's mononuclear cells like lymphocytes and epithelial cells. You can do a skeletal muscle biopsy. A mononuclear cell, in case you don't know, is basically a single nucleated cell. So lymphocytes, monocytes are circulating, peripheral blood, uh, and then there's mononuclear cells like epithelial cells, for example. Those are sometimes used. The gold standard for magnesium testing is what's called the magnesium loading or magnesium retention test. This is basically 8 to 12 hours of an IV magnesium drip straight into the blood. They know how much they give you with a certain period of time. Then they catch your urine for 24 hours and test how much magnesium's in there. They look at how much they gave, how much came out. If you hold on to about 20 to 30 percent, protocols differ on this somewhat, but 20 to 30 percent is considered magnesium deficiency because your body retains so darn much of it. Your body was deficient, it loved it, said thank you so much, and it's holding on to it, and so it excreted less. That's the gold standard. Now, when you're looking at different measurements or laboratory assessments of magnesium, it'd be really good if we compared them to this gold standard test. So, let's look at is serum. We're going to talk about serum, we're going to talk about a lot, but serum, Red blood cell, talk about urine, talk about ionized, talk about is skeletal muscle biopsies accurate? Got so much to talk about. First of all, just look at the date of this pu publication, 1968. That was over 50 years ago. 1968, they said, the magnesium content of the plasma is an unreliable guide to body stores. Muscle is a more accurate guide to the body content of this intracellular cation. For over 50 years, we've known that magnesium content in the serum or in the plasma is not reliable. But let's look at more. The next two papers are looking at uh, hypertensives that are taking a, uh, a thiazide or a diuretic. And what they found here is to the extent that mononuclear magnesium content, mononuclear cells, mirrors the body ion stores, so basically they're saying that mononuclear magnesium levels is a proxy for total body stores, our results indicate that thiazides induce a magnesium depletion in mononuclear cells, not detectable by monitoring serum levels. What does that say? Magnesium serum is normal, mononuclear cell magnesium is low, they are magnesium deficient, but you wouldn't know it by looking at serum. And this is in people taking a di diuretic, but think about this. 
if that's possible in them, is it possible for someone who's not on a diuretic to have normal serum magnesium but be deficient at a cellular level? And the answer, of course, would be yes. Here's another one, but this is even worse. Hypertensive taking diuretics had higher serum magnesium levels despite magnesium deficiency using the magnesium loading test as a control, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is even worse. Their serum magnesium looked even higher. So serum magnesium is not accurate. How about red blood cell magnesium? I can tell you in the functional and integrative medicine industry, a lot of people love red blood cell magnesium because of the story that's being told about it. But as stories go, sometimes they're wrong. Here's a great paper, challenges in the diagnosis of magnesium status. Red blood cell magnesium levels are often cited as preferable to serum or plasma because there's more magnesium in a red blood cell. There's more red, uh, magnesium in a red blood cell than there are lymphocytes, uh, more than platelets, and more than the serum. However, most of the studies that are using red blood cell magnesium endpoints don't satisfy a long-term design. They haven't been well studied enough and, they went on to say, that have not been performed in nearly enough randomized clinical studies to be considered sufficiently robust or reliable. Well, that's not good. They go on, however, and say that in addition, the majority of red blood cell studies do not validate the method through intercompartmental sampling. And of course, what they mean by that is they're not comparing it to other things like skeletal muscle levels of magnesium or the magnesium loading test. This therefore challenges the claim that the test is a reliable representation of the large magnesium pool. So lastly, let's take a look at a paper that looked at red, uh, serum magnesium, red blood cell magnesium, and now we'll add in urinary magnesium at the same time. In this particular paper, they took 97 patients that had complaints of chronic fatigue, like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, or spasmophilia, and they performed the IV loading test on them. Now, of that 97, 44%, or not 44, 44 patients were deficient in magnesium. That's a lot. So it's about half. 97 patients, chronic fatigue, 44 did the magnesium loading test, and they were deficient. Here's what they found. The mean values of serum magnesium, red blood cell magnesium, and urinary magnesium showed no significant difference between the patients with or without magnesium deficiency. So let's say this one more time. 97 patients had some kind of chronic fatigue syndromes or symptoms. 44 of them were magnesium deficient per the magnesium loading test. But in all of them, they basically all had the same serum, red blood cell, and urinary magnesium levels. Meaning that in 44 of those patients, there's a good chance that their magnesium deficiency might have been missed. To watch the rest of this video, you're going to have to head over to our website, Practice Up. That's where we talk about all this and so much more, so much more clinical information to help you become a better practitioner. I hope to see you there.